morning, Covenant Church. Good to see you. I love you. Welcome to Kenny Campus. Woo. Good to be here with you. Thank you so much. I'm at McKinney now, if you didn't know that. I'm the campus pastor there with my husband, and we're loving it. We're enjoying it. I hope McKinney's clapping right now. I'll get a report later, see if y'all are as excited as I am about it. Uh, But I haven't seen you in 2019, so it's good to be here in Carrollton as well. Miss you, love you. God's good, and uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces, and That's always a wonderful thing. So we're just gonna jump right into the word. How about that today? All right, so uh, this is between series and Pastor Stephen, our senior pastor, gave me the liberty to speak on what I felt the Lord was saying right now for this season. And this message has really been something that's been brewing in my heart. And honestly, I wasn't sure if I was even ready to share it today because I know when it it is confronting ideas that I have internally and that it's changing my posture and I really, I I kept trying to scrap it and throw it out and start over and do something else and the Lord kept bringing me back to this word for this time. So I believe that then, if I'm the messenger and I'm obviously walking through this word as well, that God sends the messenger when we're ready to receive a message. And I believe I'm in a room full of people who have been in a holding pattern and you are ready to see that cycle broken, ready to see things shift, ready to see change, (laughs) weary and worn out with the same old, same old. And uh, you know there's a promise, you know there's a prophetic word, but it's like, what do I do next? And this is what's important about understanding the sovereignty of God and the balance therein with what we are obligated to move into and accountable to and to activate. We don't just read the word of God and we're not just hearers only, amen? We're not just hearers only, amen? We are doers of the word. And when we are doers of the word, that means we leave here with things a little shaken up and we have a what's next step. Each of us, that may be something different, but that's what's powerful about the gift of the Holy Spirit is that he invades your space when you give him permission and he comes in and says, all right, this is where we've been, this is where we're going, now what you wanna do? You ready to go? Amen. So I wanna take you to the book of Genesis. Abraham and Sarah were given a son named um, Isaac, and this boy was the promised seed, and he marries Rebecca, and she's barren, and he prays over her that she will become pregnant, and she conceives, but we're gonna catch up with the word at Genesis, the address is Genesis 25, 22 through 24. And this gives us the text where we begin with Rebecca's spiritual sonogram, okay? So she knows she's pregnant, but this pregnancy doesn't feel or look like her friend's pregnancies. And this was before you could just go check things out and see what was going on underneath, but the Holy Spirit knew that she was concerned when she came to him, and this is what the narrator tells us, as well as what she replies. Verse 22 says this, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. I can't imagine the surprise of having two babies when you weren't expecting to have two babies. Uh, And this is, you know, biblically, um, this is a, a new thing. Rebecca didn't know a lot about twins, probably didn't know what was going on. I, I really feel her here because I carry twins. I took a pregnancy test and I was already sick as a dog, knew that I was pregnant and the line did not even show up. Two days later, the line was black, not purple. (laughs) 
I was so sick, I told my husband, I said, the only way I could be sicker than I was with pregnancy one and pregnancy two, because I was hospitalized both with those for, for being so ill in the beginning, I said, the only way I could be sicker is if there's two babies. And I have a Bible from 1978 that I wrote boy-girl twin names in, so I believe I'm pregnant with twins. I was a month pregnant. I go to the doctor, and they do the first sonogram, and they, they find this tiny little peanut, and she's measuring it to tell me how far along I am. And I said, you know, if you just would, would you please just check really well? I'm pretty sure there's another baby in there. She laughed at me and she's like, no, there's just one baby. And the sonogram freezes as she's calculating you know, what she's doing and when she wakes the sonogram machine back up, she screams. And when she screams, we both gasp and she said, hold on, hold on, hold on, oh, oh, oh. And I said, what's going on? She said, uh, wait a minute, there's a baby on the other side of your uterus. And I said, on the outside of my uterus? <laughs> And uh, she said, no, you were right. There are two babies, but they are, uh, they are on the exact opposite side. So we know from the beginning they are not identical twins. They're fraternal. I knew that I knew that I was carrying twins. But from the beginning, when they started moving, it got to be really strange. The first twin who was identified, the one she saw in the beginning, she called twin A. That was our son. He was on the right side. On the left side, twin B was our daughter. We didn't know she was a daughter till later on. And when I began to feel them move, it, it was cataclysmic. It wasn't like the other pregnancies. When Molly Kate, see, she was a bossy britches. We found that out pretty quick. My husband said she took after me right from the beginning. But she did little karate moves in the womb. And when she would do that, Tate, her brother, would move all the way over to the side of my body to get away from that girl. <laughs> and in doing so, it would create a donut shape. I could put my hand down in the center to my abs in the middle. It was very strange. I can only imagine how Rebecca, not knowing what was going on, felt about what was happening internally. So God let her in on the secret. Girl, I know we don't have a sonogram, but I'm telling you right now, you've got two nations in your womb. And so when she is delivering, twins come out. And this is how they are described by the word of God when they're born. So when we read verse 25, it says, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called him Esau. Okay, so this is when you're reading the Bible and this is when I go, er? <laughs> Hit the brakes, I've never seen a baby covered in hair. Have you ever seen a baby with chest hair before? <laughs> so when I read this, the picture I get is like baby Grinch, but like red, <laughs> like that. <laughs> this is Esau. This is what the Bible says. This is like a hairy garment all over. It's descriptive. This baby is, he's not even so ugly, he's cute. He just ain't cute. Can you imagine? Be like, twins were a shock, but now, you know, I've got, good Lord, what is this? I, I know you said two nations, but I didn't think two species were coming out. He had a baby orangutan was born first. So they called him Esau because Esau means Harry. So he was Prince Harry before there's Prince Harry, all right? Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob, which means to grasp the heel. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. See, he didn't even have a face a mother could love. She loved Jacob. Isaac, Isaac loved Esau. You know, I figured this out. He looked like a wild animal, so animals probably just came up to him. That's why he was such a great hunter. I mean, he was already in hiding. He didn't even need a zoot suit. He didn't even have to worry about camo. He blended right in. That's why he was a good hunter. They, they were obviously not identical twins, right? But Esau was described by his appearance. First impression by his parents. 
Jacob's first impression was not in appearance, but in position. He was named by his nature. He's striving for that. You know, I told you that I had what was labeled twin A, which was Tate, and twin B, which is Molly Kate. But when it's time to have them, and we go in to have them, they're both head down, they're both ready to go, and then all of a sudden, in the last few seconds before, he moves position, and she's born first. So who was twin A is now twin B. Molly Kate's born first, because she's like, get out of here, brother. And he is, his name is Christian Tate, but we say we should have named him wait or late, because he's late for everything and even his own birthday. And so he, he, let her, he let her get out first. Well, then he's head up in the wrong position. He's gotta be flipped. And I realize when I'm reading this about twins, how random and how quick something can shift to make who was first last and who was last first. Why is this important? Because the randomness of birth order even the family we're born into, the circumstances, the gender we are, all the things we cannot choose have such a bearing on how we enter, what our position in the world, how we look at the world, how we exited the womb is how we enter many situations. Our culture, our upbringing, the lack we have. And for Jacob, Esau's heel, that hairy heel in his face, was the first thing he grabbed onto, but the thing he could not let go of. I'm sure they separated them right away, but he never really let go of it. He, he began his life in a holding pattern that would set a course for him that was significant. Now, why is that? Because this is the deal. In ancient times, there wasn't really anything left for second sons, the firstborn, they, they inherited everything. They got the father's favor, they got the father's time, the father mentored them. This is how society was set up, okay? Culturally, nothing was left for second sons. And the randomness of being a twin, it wasn't like he was born nine months later. He was seconds away, he just barely missed the lottery a son could win. Just barely, by seconds, moments. Enough to where they were both in the birth canal at the same time if his hand was on Esau's heel. So Esau's heel for him, for Jacob, was the symbol of his struggle. That I almost missed it. Somebody got there first. Somebody is going to be honored and I'm not because I missed the moment. Esau's heel was his enemy. And you know, I wanna ask you this morning to contemplate as I roll through the notes today, what could be Esau's heel in your story? What is that thing that is always in your face, the feet that's in your face that tells you you're not enough? Because see, this is what you need to remember is heels scripturally were always a sign of oppression. So anytime someone was under your foot or that term was used, it was I am on top of you, I, I lord over you, I'm oppressing you, I'm crushing you. So to be under someone's heel means I am less than. I've been pushed down, I've been pushed back, I've been, I've been lorded over, things are against me. When a heel was set against someone, that, that showed an aggravation in relationship and position. What's the heel that's been in your face? What is that thing? Could it be for you something that might be cultural or maybe even just for, like for me, I'll share with you, I don't feel the heel at Covenant Church, but as a, as a female pastor, when I leave and I leave this protected environment, this womb, so to speak, I definitely know the heel is real about women in ministry when I leave this place. People make it known. And you can tell me all day long, you love that I'm called and you love that I've said yes, but don't tell me the heel ain't real. I know the heel is real. People come up to me with scriptures, send me long emails telling me all the reasons. God, he, if, if God wanted women to speak, he would have done this, this, and this. And I say, sorry, he did it, bro. <laughs> he did it. I didn't want this. I said yes. 
I didn't ask for it. It was a gift, it was given. But I'm gonna hang on to what God's given me. And I'm not gonna apologize for it because, they, but the heel is real, the offense, the prejudice is real. So whatever that heel is real in your life, you know, we talked a little bit about this at Flourish, and, and, I, and I, I know this can be controversial, and I know that, that a lot of people have hitched their political wagons to Black Lives Matter, but this is something that really bothers me. It really bothers me when people have been raised in white privilege, and then they say, they clap back with all lives matter. Okay, of course all lives matter to me and to God and to those who do not have prejudice. But in the judicial system, if my son commits a crime and a boy of color commits the same crime, he gets twice to three times the time. So to me, all lives matter. But in our country, it's not set up to value people the same. And you know, all countries are different. When I went to Johannesburg, the country is set up to value a, a certain shade. When you go to Zimbabwe, it's completely flipped the other way. Prejudice works in a, in a reverse fashion. Every nation is different, every culture can be different. But don't go around telling people the heel isn't real when feet have been in their face for all of their lives. If you don't think white privilege is real, try to go down the street and, and look for Band-Aids that match the shade of someone's darker skin. Nude, it, when we say nude, it, it matches me. It doesn't match everybody else. Don't, you may not think there's white privilege, but if you say that you white, <laughs> you don't see it because the heel has not been in your face. The oppression has not been felt by you. You have a different heel, okay? You might have a different heel. I'm sure you do, we all have a heel. But don't go un, un, uh, around invalidating people's experience and their struggle, please. Not in this holy place. We're gonna tell the truth here. And we are born, we are all born with a heel in our face. But that's not because our God is against us. In fact, the prophetic word that he gave Rebecca, he already broke the rules of culture from the beginning because he said, the older will serve the younger. God has set you up as second, to come in second place, to be last, so that when he flips the script, guess who's first in line to receive? He hadn't set you up to fail. He changed the rules, he broke the rules for you. You don't live according to this culture, you live according to kingdom culture. Amen? Amen. Amen. But, but we can't go around saying outside of the kingdom that there ain't no hairy heels in our face. There are, there are heels. And this is what happens is when, like Jacob, he had to physically let go of Esau's heel, but, but he couldn't let go of the ideal that heel represented, right? It was the favor of his father. It was getting the blessing of his culture. It was the difference between lack and abundance. So he decides something that a lot of us have done in our lives. He decides if I can't beat the heel, if I can't make my father dislike Esau and love me, if I can't beat the heel, I'm gonna be the heel. So he pulls on a hairy costume the Bible says he cooks up some bull and he makes it tasty. See, you gotta remember this, when you're pretending, see, when pulling the heel, when grasping and striving no longer works for you, you begin pretending to be something you, you hate in order to get something you think you need from someone who can't even see you. That is the holding pattern the enemy wants to keep you in. He wants to hold you hostage in a holding pattern where you look at it and believe I need this from someone who's blind to me, who does not even recognize me. And see, this is what he finds out real quick, Jacob, is when you don't got favor, you gotta have flavor. So you start spicing up that bull to make it sound right, to make it taste right. And Isaac even looks and he goes, you know what? He, uh, uh, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. He says numerous times, 
I am Esau. Bless me, I am Esau. He claims a name thinking he'll get a blessing and instead it brings about a curse because this is what happens. When you decide to be the heel of oppression, everybody starts hanging on to you. People start pulling you down. People start pulling you back. So it's no longer just about striving to reach for what you're not enough in, but then someone is hanging on to you because when you become the heel, you become the ideal for them. And it's all pretense. See, this was what happens to Jacob. He leaves after he's deceived his father. He's afraid of Esau, his brother, so he flees to his uncle Laban. When he goes to Laban, he ends up being manipulated systematically. He ends up in debt to his, his uncle Laban. His, his wives fight among themselves. His children are bickering all the time, fighting over him. He is beholden. He keeps asking, please release me. Let me li- leave. And Laban will not release him because he's the heel. Laban's hanging on to him. This is the holding pattern he's in. He can't move forward because he's pretended to be something he's not, and so he is pulling and reaching towards success while everybody is pulling and reaching for his attention. See, striving is contagious. You think you're gonna isolate striving to just your job or just your career, it, that isn't what happens. Your children see what your priorities are. Your children see how much more time you invest in things outside of the will of God for your life uh, in, in balance to how much time you might give or attention you might give to the calling on your life. They see more is caught than taught. They pick that up. Striving's contagious. So he becomes the heel and he becomes the one being pulled on. So Jacob gets weary. See, he's born with a good grip. All newborns are. We have, when we're born, we come into the world, we have no lower body strength at all. It's all in the grip, right? A newborn can hang on to anything. It's, how, it's like peeling their fingers away. They hold on, right? But as he grew, he gained strength. He gained and acquired skills as a man. He manipulated while he was being manipulated. But he got sick of the holding pattern he was in. He was tired of it. And when he'd had enough and he knew he needed to confront his brother Esau, he wanted peace. He'd been grasping all his life and this is what he was striving for next was to settle the score with his brother. Whatever it was, he wanted it to be finally over. He wanted the pattern to break. So this is where we pick up with him in Genesis, I think it's 35, 32. It's Genesis 32, 22 through 25. This is where we see Jacob. He's left Laban. He's headed toward Esau, and this is the night before he's supposed to meet his brother. And he arose that night and took two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. What do we learn from this? We learn that they wrestled all night long. That was quite a time for a man to wrestle a principality. What does that tell us? It tells us Jacob was strong because the angel couldn't beat him, right? So physically, he didn't just have a good grip anymore. His lower body strength was strong enough to hold his own against a principality. And while he could hold his own, they were probably balled up all night. One has the upper hand, then the other. But he couldn't get free, so in order to get free, he knew this, and and wrestlers know this, if you've ever known anything about wrestling, you know that all the power is in the hips. If you can turn their hips, you can win. You can change their position. You can get them to lose their balance, right? So the angel knew this, so he doesn't just turn his hips, he takes his hips from him by removing one, pushing one out of socket. So this is what I know about wrestling, and I want you to picture this with me. This is how I read the Word of God, but let's just all go there. Let's just picture it. So they've been fighting all night. They're both tired. The angel is trying to get away, but Jacob won't let go of him. So Jacob then loses all his lower body strength. So his position deteriorates very quickly. What that means is, is when your hip is out of socket, 
You can't even sit on your knees and hold on because the pain is excruciating. It's actually the sciatic nerve that runs all the way from the hip to the Achilles heel. He would have been suffering in agony. He couldn't have put any pressure on that hip that was out of joint. So instead of you picturing him hanging on, maybe kneeling, that is not the position. When an angel is trying to get away from him and Jacob can only use his upper body strength, all his lower body strength, all the skills in the world meant nothing when he was lined up in a wrestling match with God. God stripped him of his strength, and in that moment, he falls all the way to the feet of the angel he's wrestling. So picture Jacob laying flat on his stomach, hip completely twisted out of joint, and the only strength he's got left is the grip he was born with. Do you see the mirror image in the position? The angel is struggling to get free even after he hurts Jacob. Jacob will not let go. Jacob's hanging on with everything he has left, but it's the picture of the position he came into the world in. See, when you wrestle with God, God will show you how long you've been in a holding pattern. How deep that nature of striving really goes. How far back we gonna go, God? Oh, we gonna go all the way back. We gonna go back as far as we need to go. And see, wrestling is not a pretty sport to watch. It's not glamorous. But this is what I've learned about real people who wrestle with God is you can't worry about looking like you're winning. The people who are, who are concerned about looking like they're winning are not the ones who are winning. When your focus is on how you look, when you are finally holding on to the right feet, you do not care if you're pretty. You only care if you prevail. God set him up for the position that he was really good at. I can only imagine. See, I see God lining us all up. He does this. He sets you in a position where again you feel the inferiority that you have spent your life trying to get yourself up out of. And God will line up a situation that requires humility, where then you are choosing to put yourself in a position that looks just like the one that created your problem. But that's when God lines it all up, then he says, let's ask who really wants to be blessed. What is your name? The angel asked him, he says, for the first time he has ever claimed his name, he says, Jacob, the one who grasps. And in that moment, the pattern, the holding pattern is broken forever because God says this over him. From now on, you are no longer gonna be known as the one who grasps, but the one who gets. You're no longer gonna be known as the one who fights Jacob, but the one who wins. You are no longer gonna be known as the one who strives, but the one who thrives, because I am taking away the striving from you, and I am giving you what you wanted to begin with, what your earthly daddy was incapable of giving you, and that is the blessing of heaven. I am behind you. You are mine. You have wrestled with men and with God, and you have prevailed. See, this is what happens, is when you've had feet in your face your whole life, by the flesh, you can get stuck in a holding pattern where it's like, no, I'm never gonna choose that. I'm never gonna choose trust again, I've been hurt. I'm never gonna serve in a church again, I've been hurt by a church. And only God knows when he lines you up to put you in that same position where inferiority raises its ugly head, you have to remember in that moment, wait a minute, I finally got my face at the right feet. 
I finally have my hand on the right heel. And I'm not gonna let go of this piece of God I've got. See, this is the deal, is that you and I, we think, how do I let go of that heel? You can't let go of that heel of opposition, of oppression, of addiction, of slavery mentality, of poverty mentality. You can't let go of any of that on your own. You were built to hold on. You've gotta get your grasp, your grip, and see, God will put you in a situation and he'll say, how strong is that grip? Show me that grip, Amy. You've held on to a lot of other things. Show me how you're gonna hold on to your healing, Amy. Yesterday, eight year anniversary yesterday for me of healing. But God will line it up for you. God will line it up for you where there ain't any other heels that matter. See, I know some women who decided to put their face at the feet of Jesus and break all the rules and get a healing instead of somebody else's heel because they got their face at the right feet. You know, I just finished the well yesterday. We finished the well, and we have women that serve every month. They, they take their vacation to come serve for five days so that 24 women can have a life-altering encounter. And every time these women come serve, I find myself in my car crying and thanking God that there are people, because I know their stories. I know how wounded they've been even by church leadership. And I looked at, yesterday I looked around the table and I talked to them and I said, you know, uh, there were many of them that are African American and I said, you know, when I look at you and I watch you serve with your whole heart, that shows me the picture of Jacob holding the feet because only the right feet can set you free. And I know that when you're three or four generations removed from slavery, you could choose to say, I'm never gonna serve. Why would I serve? The world owes me something, and you'd be right. But you'd never be putting yourself in a humble position to receive all the power of, of Israel. You'd never be putting yourself in a position to have God remove the heel from your face and the name that's always lorded over you that says, I'm not enough. If you wanna let go of the heel that you feel like you've been holding on to, you know it's not the right one. You need to get a handful of God. I want you to stand up with me right now because that holding pattern can only be broken by activation. We have to do something different to get a different response in our life. And whatever Esau's heel is, whatever that symbol of your enemy's oppression God is saying, your focus has been on the wrong thing. And I was gonna let you hold on to that heel till you get so tired of it, you're ready to break the cycle. And I believe you are. I want you to lift your hands with me if you would. All this is, is we're just, we have an open hand. This is symbolic of I'm letting go. Father, we thank you right now that all the power of heaven comes to attend us in this moment. We've wrestled with man and we've wrestled with you. And we realize and recognize that you've put us in inferior positions, not because you are against us, but because you are for us. You've already prophetically promised that we are the head and not the tail. You already flipped the script when you said the older will serve the younger. So in every way that Esau has seemed to be in front of us, we let go of Esau's heel right now. Whatever that is, whatever oppression, whatever addiction, whatever uh, lack of opportunity, we let go of those things and we take hold of the hem of your garment right now. And we will hold on and we will not let go until you bless us. We will not let go until we hear the name you call us by, the name of multiplication, the name of blessing, the name of increase. In Jesus' name, we let go of those things and we take a hold 